Welcome, everyone, to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Hey, Chris. Hello. Oh, greetings. Happy September. Happy autumn. Happy fall, as you say, uh, in, uh, in the colonies. Yes, happy fall. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The leaves are turning, and it's back to school in the States, so it's perfect Doctor Who weather. Uh, yeah, well, this is kind of traditionally when Doctor Who starts, isn't it? Sort of like going way, way back to like the classic era. I was going to say it's good weather to be talking about Doctor Who. Any weather is good weather to be talking about Doctor Who. <laughs> I was just going to thinking, um, as we were saying before the show, um, that it might be a, 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 an idea just to kind of doff our proverbial cap um, to mark the passing of, um, of, of Victor Pemberton. You know, his, his death was announced uh, sort of since the last show. And whilst he didn't write many stories, I mean, he was a script editor on a TV show, um, and uh, he uh, he wrote the first original um, Doctor Who audio story, of course, Doctor Who and the Pesketons, and and wrote the, the novelization of that and Fury from the Deep. And whilst I've not read the Pesketons, I mean, I do remember greatly enjoying Fury from the Deep, and just because it was quite a a different story and in. From the typical fair, and and in some ways you say maybe pave the way for unit if you squint a bit, mm. possibly. I haven't read uh, Fury from the Deep, but I've listened to the audio, and then of mm. course have listened to the audio of uh, the Pescatons too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, created the Sonic Screwdriver, didn't he? He did. He did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he also wrote the um, the brilliant scene in Tomb of Cybermen that. Uh, was uh, used uh, in various parts of the internet uh, to mark the passing of uh, Deborah Watling, um, which is the um, the scene in which uh, the, the second Doctor and um, sort of Victoria kind of talk about uh, their families and how they can um, how they can always sort of see them when they close their eyes and their memories and oh it's just it's just gorgeous and they sleep in their mind yeah yeah oh. yeah it's a wonderful scene. Yeah. So uh, yes, yes, yes. So just raise a proverbial mug to, uh, to to him and and Deborah Watling and also Trevor Blacksonville. It's it's been a rough old month. Yeah, uh, it has. Uh, yes. So anyway, sorry. That's that's a downer <laughs> start. But um, yes, yes. Well, it'll it'll be all nice and cheerful from now on in because there's no stories we're going to be discussing uh, this month that are at all grim or despondent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a few of those sprinkled in yeah. Yeah. <laughs> shades of saint anthony's fire in there. yes yes maybe right yeah i have something a little bit more cheerful for show and tell mm. this month yay so i'm going to talk about the rift tracks live event for the five doctors and yes. this was a U.S. only event, so I don't think it came to Canada no. or England. I ended up attending both the live show on August 17th and then the encore on August 24th. And I wanted to go to both of them just because there wasn't any guarantee that these would come out on video. Some of their live events do and some don't. It depends if they can secure the home video rights or not. Mm. <laughs> I guess the BBC probably are a bit precious on that sort of thing. Yeah, so it seems <laughs> seems rather unlikely. They've also riffed the two uh, Peter Cushing Dalek films, but I noticed that they had taken those down from their site for sale. So I don't know if they had perhaps lost the rights to those, but um, if you had previously purchased them, you can still access the files in the archive for the time being. So I downloaded a uh, spare backup copy just in case. So these are the, the Riff Tracks kind of comedy team which is from the kind of the second art incarnation of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Mike was the host seasons five through 10. Because they're a local group, I see quite a few of them out and about at conventions, comedy shows, and like at special uh, movie screenings and stuff. And going back, I even remember some of the UHF uh, KTMA bits uh, that aired locally before MST3K became like a national thing. At the uh, event, I recognized... Uh, some fans both from convergence and from console room but i didn't really see any cosplay apart from the odd doctor who or mystery Th science theater 3000 t-shirt i will say that i never thought i'd see the five doctors on the big screen so that was really cool when uh william hartnell first came on screen at the beginning there for the kind of prologue from a uh, dalek invasion of earth uh <laughs> kind of got chills seeing that so that was really cool 
it was it was fun. It was uh it was very much a kind of a layperson's take on the show. So it's not okay. Yeah, it's not the same sort of riffs with obscure references that you'd find at <laughs> conventions. Like uh, I know there's the mystery three three seven comedy group that uh, riffs Doctor Who episodes in the states at at different conventions, which is fine because you know they were going for a wider audience and kind of casual fans. I will say Sylvester McCoy cannot catch a break. There was a. Uh, <laughs> There was there's a slide during the pre-show that said uh, something to the effect of Peter Cushing will never be canonical, but Sylvester McCoy unfortunately always will be. Aww. Yeah. So that was that reminded me a little bit of uh, the Doctor Who Night sketch that David Williams and Mark Gatiss did, and they later edited out some of those types of comments from that. Um, <laughs> Another slide before the show was like an anagram puzzle and half the audience was shouting Doctor Who and the other half was Torchwood. So that was kind of funny to see. <laughs> and before the event, they aired a uh, short film. It looked like it was from the early 80s or late 70s, a British short called Play Safe. And it was made by an electric power council or something. And it uh, had like an animated bird and an owl and a bunch of uh, kids dying in unusual ways. <laughs> Right. <laughs> including flying kites into electrical lines, uh, moving a sailboat under power lines, breaking into a substation to retrieve a frisbee, all sorts of things like that. So that was kind of funny. They did. They used the uh, the special edition from the early nineties. So they were they were commenting on how they thought those effects weren't fully rendered. <laughs> One of the riffs. So I'd hate to hear what they thought of the original effects. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And maybe the deepest cut in terms of like a reference was uh, the they referenced the show getting canceled a year later, referring to the hiatus. Yeah, they knew enough to know that Richard Herndell wasn't uh, William Hartnell. Okay. Some of their other riffs, uh, like when the Doctor first stepped out onto the Eye of Orion, uh, the riff was, uh, oh, "It's so nice being out here on film." <laughs> <laughs> And they uh, they commented on uh, the death zone. Uh, it was nice that they maintained paved roads for Bessie. Yes. And uh, things like referring to Turlow as Ron Weasley, uh, Tegan as Pat Benatar. Um, there was one reference to Tegan and Sarah when they met. Uh, yeah. yeah. Playing Lilith Fair. Yeah. They made a lot of fun about like Sarah's tumble down the hill, the Raston warrior robot, <laughs> Baruza collecting action figures, Sarah Jane on her way to Purple Con, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. So it was it was a lot of fun. Cool. And hopefully uh, they did confirm on Twitter that they're planning on releasing a Just the Jokes MP3 that will sync to the DVD and that the Play Safe short was going to be released separately. So at least huh? people get to see most of it, I think. So it was Play Safe a, a genuine thing? There was a, uh, a a campaign in Melbourne in Australia for um, about kind of just general safety called um, um, Dumb Ways to Die, which was a um, a charming animation of, sort of depicting deaths. Some sound very like what you just described. The, the, the 21st century spirit of that lives on. Yeah, so what, that was a genuine thing from the 70s. Yes, yeah, late 70s, early 80s, I would say, and. Uh... It was mostly live action. The only animated parts were the like the owl and the bird kind of commenting on everyone's demise. Well, that that happens all the time in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah, so that was uh the Rift Tracks uh event. It was it was a lot of fun. It would be great if they did more in the future. It seems like it was pretty well attended, so yeah. Fingers crossed. But uh, even if it was just a one-off event, it was uh, it was fun. I wonder what you would do from the classic era. Maybe vengeance on Zaros. I don't know. Um, but there's a few interesting ones that, 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 that they could go for. Yeah. Uh, but it's just uh, obviously the five doctors is nice because there's yeah you know, so many yeah because it's the greatest hits compilation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so don't tell them about the uh, the children in need thing from uh, from <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah <laughs> I guess I guess the, the McGann TV movie that would probably be the next. Yeah, that would. Uh, it's yeah. also feels eminently riff trackable. So. Yeah, <laughs> that would be a, that'd be a great one. And it would let them show their um, their love of Sylvester, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but, uh, yes. Anyway. Yeah. So what do you have for uh, show and tell? So so my show and tell is um, it's a story rather than necessarily a thing. So on Tuesday I was boarding the Jubilee line in London's glittering underground 
it was kind of rush hour and there was you know as usual kind of like lots of sort of sweaty armpits and stuff and then i realized that three people across from me um was a gentleman reading illegal alien um <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah just 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 you know brazenly reading doctor who on his journey home uh and i kind of thought okay how do i can I, can I get to you in a way that's not at all weird or creepy because you know Londoners don't really speak to strangers on the tube. I, I kind of did a little because I only had about five stops, and, uh, and so I did a little bit of strategic manoeuvring, and uh, utterly failed to speak to him because uh, I suddenly and I thought, do I just say something as you know? Do I just lean in, say hello? listen to our podcast uh, and and then sort of um, leave him in a bewildered state as I drop off to, um, at the next stop. So if you were a Londoner uh, yes. re- reading Illegal Aliens and you yes, saw someone in... appear to approach you and then <laughs> back away. And then back away, yeah. So if you were kind of going from London Bridge heading east uh, on um, sort of Tuesday the 22nd, about half past five, uh, and you were in a lime green shirt, hi, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll try not to be weird. Um, so, if if ever you see anybody reading Doctor Who, um, sort of feel free to sort of go over and say hello. I think that's probably a, yeah, what what people should do. Yeah, that's great. Yes, yeah, it's very exciting. I've, I've not seen somebody reading kind of a BBC books thing quite some time. It, it took me a little while to kind of figure out what it was because I, all I could just see was the back, so I could see the image of Sylvester McCoy, and and I was sort of far enough away that I couldn't quite read the blurb and then I just sort of saw some sort of poking over the shoulder of a couple of people I saw some references to Cybermen and I thought, ah that must be a legal alien very cool yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one time I saw someone reading a Doctor Who book in public <laughs> and it's a, a rare occurrence in uh stateside but it was um yeah. Kathy Sullivan who has written for Big Finish and she's an author in her own right and I didn't know who who she was at the time but this was bef- after uh the eighth doctor books had started coming out but there hadn't been a u.s distributor for them yet so mm-hmm. it had been like maybe a year or two where i was aware that these books were coming out from the bbc now instead of virgin but had no way to really get them without importing them and this was mm-hmm. you know very early days of the internet and so forth uh so i struck up conversation with her and she was uh waiting in queue at a star trek convention which is uh kind of funny and it turns out she introduced herself as kathy and then and then i realized oh this was the same kathy sullivan that um had been sending me tapes uh for the last year or two as part of the old uh tape tree network for uh oh all the reconstructions that were going on mm. so uh yeah kind of a weird thing where we met in line and uh realized hey you're, you've been supplying my doctor who fix for <laughs> <laughs> for the past few years uh on vhs yeah, yeah, yeah. small world yeah, yeah it, is, it, is, it is but also i think sort of striking a conversation to do with a doctor who book at a star trek convention is probably sort of less likely to cause upset than sort of like you know <laughs> packed tube <tube-carried>. carrot. <laughs> yeah it was a fairly uh safe place to approach <laughs> yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, so our uh book for this month isn't hmm. really a book but it's uh 16 short stories uh collected together as short trips hmm. the original you might say Yes. From, uh, <laughs> from BBC Books. So this was preceded by five um, decalogues, which were collections of 10 stories each uh, from Virgin mm-hmm. Publishing. And then BBC Books decided to give it a try and put out three volumes of their own uh, yeah. anthology. And then Big Finish picked up the moniker after that, and they've released quite a few volumes, mm-hmm. both on audio and uh, and in print. So yeah. Lots of anthologies, but this is the first one we've uh, reviewed. Yeah. Yes, yeah. You should mention, too, that there will be some shorter dramatic readings sprinkled in, probably more than one, but in the interest of time, we're not going to be setting them up. A lot of this will kind of come together in the edit, I think, and, and half of the stories were never dramatized or or spoken either. <laughs> or spoken of ever again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, until now. <laughs> yes, it's not the end. <laughs> uh, spoilers, there's at least one stinker in this, uh, in my personal opinion. <laughs> Just the one. <laughs> uh, no, the, the, we'll we'll talk about each of the each of the yes. stories and then kind of give yeah. our uh, review of the collection at the end. I wanted to mention too that um, the audios for this originally came out on cassette, 
and they were spread over three different releases with five different narrators. And those have been collected and are available on iTunes in the Tales from the TARDIS collection, which collects uh, Short Trips, Earth and Beyond, and Out of the Darkness, which is the titles you can find the, the audios on. All right, so the format for this month, we're going to have kind of a lightning round style, five minutes per book, and I've got a timer here. So mm-hmm. we'll see if this works. And then when the timer ends, you'll hear the sound of the TARDIS <laughs> starting to take off. So we'll uh, try and wrap up each uh, recap by then. So we're going to try and spend maybe like a minute or so on the author and the setting, a yeah. couple minutes on the recap, and then a couple minutes on our reactions too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're helped by the fact that some some authors reoccur. Uh, so um, we, do, we only need to speak of them once. And uh, mm-hmm. we also have two pseudonym authors. Yes, I noticed that. I was wondering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so we should. We'll touch upon their real stuff rather than the fictitious descriptions of them at the back of the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, was, that was kind of funny. And if you notice, yeah. too, the, uh, the two names are, I believe, an anagram of Master or Mr. Master. There's, uh, if you look at the, mm. the author names, there's, there's some. I haven't quite sussed it out, but it, I think you, you can get Master out of both of them. So I think that the other pseudonym, which is Evan Pritchard, is a nod of the hat to Ambrose Evans Pritchard, who was an author. Oh, I thought Evan Pritchard was a real person. <laughs> no, Evan Pritchard's a pseudonym. Another pseudonym. Because you've got, you've got Tara Sands. Tar, right, who is mm-hmm. really Stephen Cole. Who was the editor of the range. Yeah. And then Sam Lester, I thought, was the other... I, I googled Sam Lester, and yeah, I'm not aware of that person um, being a pseudonym. Really? Hmm. Evan Pritchard is, though. Huh. Evan Pritchard is Rebecca Levine, who was the editor of um, The New Adventures towards the end. Oh, yeah. I didn't. I didn't realize that. I uh, I had thought the two were. I knew. I knew uh, as Tara Samus for sure. But I thought Sam Lester was also a uh, pseudonym for Stephen yeah. Cole because it's so close to Master. <laughs> yeah, it's it's similar to Master. And then it, the author blurb for Sam Lester was, Sam Lester feels his life so far is infinitely boring and surely of no interest to anyone. But with his high moral fiber now almost entirely rotted away, he has high hopes for the future. So with a blurb like that, I, would, I thought for sure. <laughs> I think Sam Lester could well be a pseudonym, just one that's not been answered. Yeah. So perhaps we have three. Yes. Yeah. So we we, we know of at least two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and 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 some people possibly should have had. Uh, okay. Right. So sh- sh- <laughs> let's, let's begin. Enough foreshadowing. Let's yep. begin. All right. So I'll go ahead and hit start. And our first story is Model Train Set by Jonathan Bloom. So uh, Jonathan Bloom uh, was um, one half of um, the great writing team of uh, Bloom and Orman. Uh, and, uh, and as it said at the back, um, rather unkindly, potentially, um, that uh, he was married to Kate Orman as of January 98. Um, I think that that's because the book hadn't been published by that point, rather than reflecting uh, any, any doubts as to... <laughs> How long that relationship was going to last? <laughs> it did take me a little while to go. Ooh, oh, okay. And he had written one of the early uh, big finishes, and I he first came to my attention from a fan video he did called Time Rift, mm. where he played the Seventh Doctor, and uh, his accent is very uh, uh, memorable, shall we say? Mm. <laughs> and it's how he met Kate Orman. Because oh. uh, Kate Orman heard that video being played and kind of came in because uh, she felt that Sylvester McCoy was was. Uh, I've not seen the video. Going from what you've said, it sounds as if his accent is not particularly spot on. It was, it was <laughs> an ambitious production. <laughs> had some uh, yeah. had some cool uh, parts, but so the yeah. summary of this yes. one: the mm. uh, the doctor is playing with a model train set that mm-hmm. he had set up in his uh, pr- one of his previous incarnations. He'd always loved trains for as long as he could remember. Even as a little boy, he dreamed of driving one. Sometimes he'd looked at the dream in a different way. At one point in his life, he would much rather have been the station master, quietly tending his plot and keeping his corner of the larger system in order. 
while at other times he would gladly have just been the man who rescued damsels from the bits of railway line to which men with curled moustaches kept tying them with alarming regularity. He suspected that one of his more recent incarnations would rather have been one of the steam engines, all bright paint and gaudy brass, puffing and chuffing about with great noise and clatter. But most recently, he had tended towards being the man in the nerve centre, routing and switching the trains on all their myriad ways, each one playing a part in the larger tapestry of schedules and goals. This was the doctor who had built the model train layout, who had machined each engine and laid each piece of track, who took a craftsman's pride in knowing every quirk and foible of the system he had engineered. He set each train on its way and happily juggled the dozens of minute details needed to keep them from interfering with each other. His pleasure came in the sight of a crisis overcome, or even better, a potential crisis avoided. He was the man who developed a childlike grin at the sight of the whole bustling network running smoothly. Finally, he'd come up with a plan in which everything worked. No matter what else you could say about him, he made the trains run on time. But now the new doctor looked at the model train set with a vaguely dissatisfied frown. It was all very well having a system which responded precisely to what you told it to do, but where was the surprise in that? And it has complete with miniature people, which I kind of imagined as like little Lego minifigs. And Mm. uh, it's a miracle of craftsmanship, but he wanted to introduce less perfection and create a system that didn't need his constant attention and supervision. And these people are moving around as well. Uh, so, yep. uh, that, yeah, and uh, one of them, um, one, the train driver, um, is wears a cricket pullover, uh, and he waves at him, uh, which I thought was rather nice. Uh, <laughs> and so the doctor introduces more and more uh, sentience into the setup, and he goes off on an adventure, and when he comes back, he finds the uh, entire model train set kind of in disarray and carnage everywhere and crashes and he gets rather uh, despondent and depressed about what happened and thinks you know they they need a strong hand to uh, watch over them and there's a lot of kind of heavy-handed allusions to earth but he noticed that there's a few of the workers were still trying to fix things and make things better so he Hmm. Uh, helps them out and uh, by riding the larger uh, trains that had toppled over and lets them kind of go about fixing things themselves, hoping that they'll learn something, you know, in the process. Mm. Yeah, it is, it's a lovely little character piece. I, I, I can see why, I mean, it, people still kind of rave about it to this day. Uh, it, it, it does seem to kind of capture the spirit of the Ape Doctor very well. I, yeah, I, 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 I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's not got, you know, there's no plot but it's just it's just it's a it's a lovely sort of way of comparing what was still a relatively new doctor to the seventh and sort of just you know highlighting to the audience um yeah, how, how different this new doctor is and that he's less manipulative mm. did you catch the reference to uh ben aradovich's book uh there's a reference to transit in there no Oh, yeah, that's what that. Uh, T- talking about the complexity of the system, he talks about yeah. it being the, the transit system. And I've heard, too, that uh, the train set is later mentioned in a couple of other uh, books, including mm. uh, Vampire Science, which was John and Kate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, uh, that was probably written at roughly the same time, if not earlier. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. No, oh, it's 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 a nice little nice little story to kind of to ease you into the collection. Yeah, I I really enjoyed this one. I thought it was one of the the more memorable ones of the of the set for sure. Mm, yes, memorable in a good way. Um... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Well, so... eighteen seconds to spare. Yay! Okay. So, should we move on to Old Flames, uh, which is um, by Paul Mars, um, who uh, was kind of entering the BBC range at, or Doctor Who range at this time, um, and it is the, um, the the first appearance of Iris Wildheim, um, who is a character that he'd written books for outside of Doctor Who before this. She is. Uh, basically a kind of you know, she, she's a time lady not necessarily a rogue one but just 
just or one who just meanders around, a bit of like a meddling monk type figure. I think possibly might be a way to look at it. Maybe it's slightly less evil. Yeah, and she was uh, played by Katie Manning in some of the mm. big Finnish audios and stuff too. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So this one, uh, the Doctor. Is it on Earth? Jane Austen novel, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's Earth. Yeah. yeah, it's basically they, they, they land in Jane Austen. <laughs> and the Doctor falls, it's wintertime, and the Doctor falls mm-hmm. through the ice in a river or a pond, and he catches a bit of a cold, and the Doctor and Sarah stay with a, uh, I guess, a priest in a rectory, mm-hmm. and they get invited to a uh, ball that's being held mm-hmm. and decide to go to that with the priest. And think of it, a genuine 18th century high society ball, he mused. I'd rather we just went on our way. I'm not... What's that? Sarah groaned. Not your big cats again. He looked surprised. It's an engine. They both looked at the source of the noise and saw, emerging through the black naked trees, the lumbering scarlet shape of a double-decker bus. They watched it labor out of sight like a rare and fabulous beast slipping back into the forest's obscurity. Ah, well, said the doctor at length. You'd be surprised how many things aren't where they're supposed to be in time. Listen, he said, perhaps we ought to go to this ball and hobnob with the locals. You look like you could do with a good night out. He blinked again. There was no denying it. It was definitely her. Across the ballroom, through the rustle and press of all those dresses, the doctor could see her quite clearly stretched out on a sofa and observing the proceedings with a benign expression of amusement. Her large, inelegant body was tucked primly into a fashionable pale olive frock. The doctor shuffled and slid across the highly polished floor until he stood before her. Iris? Doctor, she smiled, glancing up. She held out one brilliantly white-gloved hand for him to kiss. I'd heard you were in the vicinity. Well, I wish I'd known you were here, he said rudely. Oh, don't be all cross with me. She giggled and fluffed up the ostrich feathers sprouting from her tiara. Don't I look the part? In this time and place, I'm known as Lady Alice Wildtime. Isn't that marvellous? In the 18th century, I'm rather grand and own a beautiful home in the north. The doctor rolled his eyes. You're determined to have a house in every century on this planet, aren't you? Oh, you know me. I never like to settle in one place. Suddenly, the doctor gave one of his disarming grins. It's good to see you again, Iris, he said, grasping her podgy hand and giving it a brisk shake. He had forgotten, upon first seeing Iris here, that he actually enjoyed her company. Their paths are crossed on only a few occasions in the past, and when they did, it was never dull. The ball's being held by a woman, and it's either her daughter or her granddaughter. Her granddaughter, yes, yeah. Uh, So it's being held by a Lady Huntingdon, and uh, she's sort of basically... Yeah, whoever's going to marry her granddaughter will inherit the estate. We go off to a ball, and Sarah uh, and Doctor are there, and the ball is being hosted by this uh, Lady Huntington, who um, uh, is uh, sort of looking for a, uh, a sort of a husband for her granddaughter, and whoever will marry her will inherit her estate. Uh, and uh, also at the ball, Sarah encounters a. Um, a young captain who has kind of fallen out of time uh, in some capacity or other, and the doctor stumbles across Iris. Uh, and he's also sort of seen a, a double-decker bus in the woods uh, and is, is obviously expecting uh, Iris to appear. And, uh, yeah, it, it, the, you get this sort of full-on sort of Jane austen dancing in the ball and... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, we're not going to do justice to this, but I mean, I think if you enjoy, not necessarily, it's not done in the in the narrative, you know, in the writing style of Jane Austen, but it sort of feels like 
a written sort of version of a TV adaptation <laughs> of Jane Austen at some points. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's quite charming. Yeah, it really is. And Iris is attending the mm-hmm. ball to really to kind of do a land grab because she wants mm-hmm. a house in this time frame. And uh, <laughs> yeah. it turns out the uh, granddaughter and the grandmother are both uh, were tigers. So uh, <laughs> they, uh, the, the priest gets uh, mauled to death on his way home. The grandmother's stopped, and the uh, the granddaughter ends up marrying uh, Iris's companion, whom she leaves yeah. behind. But <laughs> I looked ahead, and it turns out Iris picks him up again later on, and they have a whole bunch of uh, audio adventures on in Big Finish. So yeah. Captain Turner is uh, remembered. Oh, and, uh, oh! I was just gonna say, I, I love the fact that Iris's TARDIS is the same size on the inside <laughs> as the outside. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's just a double decker bus. It's dimensionally sendental. Yes, yeah, uh, and also um, it's a it's a bus to uh, Putney, and it's a, I think it's a line that I would have caught quite a few times. I used to live in the um, the bit of London that the bus is uh, supposedly heading to. Yeah, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I I liked oh, I like yeah. this one. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 brilliant. I mean. This is only the second bit of writing by Paul Mars I've read. The uh, first was The Scarlet Empress that I read many years ago, and I just did not get on with it at all. I just found it very self-indulgent. This is just gorgeous, and I, I, I can I can understand now. I get it. Hmm. I see I see why people love Iris. I see why people love his writing. It's that's it's just brilliant. This the uh, TARDIS just went off. I don't know if we, you heard it or not, but uh, uh, no, I did not. The, okay, uh, I would just say this is also my second Paul Mars thing that I read. I also read mm-hmm. his uh, Diary of a Doctor Who Addict, which was a uh-huh. lovely little uh, semi autobiographical work that he did. Mm-hmm. All right, our next story is. War Crimes mm. by Simon Butcher Jones. Yeah, and this takes place during uh, the War Games. Apparently, during episode ten of the War Games. In the War Games, in addition to humans being lifted from their timelines, there were other creatures lifted from other planets, mm-hmm. um, including kind of a uh, like a big bear creature. Yeah. Mm. Uh, species is notable because they can change their gender. Mm. at 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 least one point in their lives this was an interesting really short story yeah it ended kind of strangely with the doctor so one of these where not i guess not a were creature but one of these bear Mm. uh kind of augmented creatures you you follow it throughout the narrative and it's kind of fighting its own internal programming that was by the uh the other warlords the creature ends up committing suicide and as the doctor's pulling it from the sea and watching it die he re- there's this kind of sharp line that it ends on with uh, saying the doctor uh, recognized the, the expression on the creature's face as being the same one that was present on Jamie and Zoe's faces when their minds were wiped. So it's kind of a yeah, in-your-face sort of... I, I thought it was quite interesting about the kind of the, the changing gender and also as well, um, um, sort of it's the this creature's tribe thinks that he's dead and they heard this weird noise of the Atardis or Sidrat actually taking the creature away the first time and then putting it back yeah so basically we have a Doctor Who story in which the Doctor doesn't appear um or any of the Atardis crew until like the final page or sort of final but two pages uh as well it's just oh I, I, yeah this, this one didn't really work for me <laughs> yeah this, not me either it was uh it was it was an interest i did the one thing i did like about it is it did kind of give gravitas to the doctor's companions minds being wiped which up until donna in the new series you didn't really have a whole lot of people you know saying like oh jamie and zoe's fate was worse than death sort of thing but Hmm. this gives you a a hint of how awful it would be to have your memories of you know your time with the doctor wiped i guess was it's the one thing i took away from it yeah we're scratching around for time uh simon butcher jones uh he's it says in the back that um um that he and his wife both changed their names and amalgamated them um into a double barrel surname uh, which is lovely that's nice yeah and this is the only 
piece of his that I've read and it doesn't leave me really keen to read any others but I did enjoy the bits of the, because you had some kind of like bureaucracy kind of stuff from the Time Lords with uh, their kind of filing their reports mm. um, that that was kind of interesting ish this is not one of my favorites Oh, yeah, me either. All right. <laughs> so we'll okay. continue on to... Mm. Evan Pritchard's work. <laughs> yes, The Last Days. <laughs> yeah, okay. Written by Rebecca Levine, as you said. Yeah, yeah since you've just learned. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I've just learned. And uh, so this one is kind of strange in that it takes place in... Uh, at the Masada Fortress in uh, Israel, which is a real place. Mm. However, um, some of the events that are purported to have taken place there, including a mass suicide of like 950 people, there isn't a whole lot, if any, um, historical evidence for that, apart from mm. the writings of Josephus, which um, mm -hmm. in some cases have been known to be forgeries or embellishments. So this is an interesting one in that it... Uh, takes place in a real location but the events mm. depicted in the story probably didn't take place or may or yeah not necessarily quite in the same way or... yeah, as they're depicted yeah 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 also i think it's probably safe to say that uh, any modern version of doctor who would avoid setting something in this kind of scenario i suspect yeah it'd be it'd be the equivalent of like the doctor uh Find, finding himself like in one of the buildings on 9-11 or something it just <laughs> i don't i don't think they would tell that story <laughs> no no because um yeah yeah because I, I remember people sort of saying that they're very excited about the seventh doctor because um because this is you know a, a doctor that you could kind of say put into sort of scenes in nazi germany and sort of like you know into the kind of things like the concentration camps and stuff and you're like yeah okay i suppose but why would you want to do that in the context of Doctor Who? sorry mm -hmm. i don't understand uh, but anyway right sorry we're getting distracted uh, so, so this is a uh, first doctor ian barbara and susan and yes. ian and barbara are on one side of the conflict within the fortress and the doctor and susan are with the romans on the outside yeah and Ian and Barbara side uh, are very kind of the people there are determined to to kind of like make this sort of last stand count, and they don't want um, the Romans basically to capture any of them. Uh, and so uh, they decide that um, that they are all going to kill themselves. And you see kind of children, you see various families, um, sort of uh, in in the people in the in the fort in Masada it does not pull its punches because you know from sort of pretty much the get-go that um, there are likely to be only two survivors uh, that were recorded in history and both of them were women so you're gonna think well barbara could be one of them mm -hmm. ian and not likely to be the other um and so you kind of have some tension injected because you're gonna think well surely there has to be a way because mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not how to go um but uh ian fakes killing barbara by slicing his own arm open and bleeding over her and then yeah. ian ends up having to kill the last 11 or so people alive and they draw lots to do it it's just it's very dark and yeah. um the doctor uh, is able to rescue them because he labels them as spies mm. that were working for him and convinces the roman general to spare their lives reluctantly after he finds you know two other survivors which are the two women and they kind of go on their way and it's just a dark little episode yeah yeah um and barbara there's a few kind of callbacks to the aztecs and because uh, barbara says to ian that look you you know you can't change history and ian says that, look i don't know this is history yeah and a continuity error with a reference to the Romans, which is with uh, Vicky. <laughs> Hasn't happened with Barbara yet, so. Yeah. Well, maybe there was another Roman adventure. There could have been, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I really enjoyed this one. Um, I mean, I don't know if necessarily enjoy is the word, but I thought it was very well told, which is why I looked up Evan Pritchard, because uh, I wanted to find out stuff. And there's the TARDIS. There's the TARDIS, yeah. yeah. Yes, and uh, the only other stuff that Rebecca Levine's I've read was uh, her, one of her um, Benny New Adventure novels um, that just basically felt like a um, a synopsis 
and not so much of a novel. Um, it was it was a wonderful surprise to discover that it was her. This is a good story. I think it's I think it's very well written. It's just yeah, the setting and the the yeah. content is was was what was troubling for me. But and how it's written, it's 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 wonderful. Hmm. And we should say the only story by a female contributor out of the 16 yes. that we're going to be talking about. That, that we're aware of. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Next up um, is by two folks. <laughs> Stop the Pigeon by the by illegal aliens, uh, Mike Tucker and Robert Perry. And Mike Tucker was a... Uh, effects supervisor uh, did mm. practical effects on the original series show and model work and uh, was brought in to do he created the um, the model of Big Ben in the first season of Eccleston or the only season of Eccleston uh, <laughs> that uh, this Levine crashed into so yeah. uh, okay. Mike Tucker goes way back with the show they, they write quite a lot of BBC um, Seventh Doctor novels as well yeah and uh, Mike Tucker also wrote uh, the book about Ace with uh, Sophie Eldred. He was her mm. co-author on that one. So S- Stop the Pigeon, this is a story. <laughs> it takes place in Croydon. Yes, in the around Croydon, uh, and, uh, which is quite close in a bit of South London that so I'm speaking to you from, dear listener. Uh, and uh, also uh, starts off with a reference as to how terrible it is commuting on, on, on the railway. And whilst uh, the company that provides the train services in this area may have changed, have the experience hasn't got much better um so you have a sweltering carriage breaking down in august yeah i know how that feels there's a lot going on in this story oh God. yeah we are gonna have to be brutal yeah we're gonna have to just kind of explain it more straightforward than we might otherwise mm. um so this one involves the master and the crinoids mm. and the master it takes place just after survival from his perspective and uh, involves uh, an elaborate scheme where the master has set up a uh, time anchor 80 years in the future uh, from 19, I guess, 87. Con- yeah, 87 or 80 years. Yeah. So 2067, there's a time anchor on that end. And the master is convincing people to go into his facility as an kind of in, in old age as like an elderly care facility. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of in a weeping angels style sort of thing goes back in time, kidnaps them as babies, brings them forward, <laughs> siphons off the life energy from the elderly people, which he uses to stave off his cheetah virus infection and then give the babies back to the families of the elderly people who come in so they have the same DNA, but he's essentially creating paradoxes. Yes. And while all that's happening, there's a... <laughs> there's a pigeon! There's a talking pigeon wandering her. Which is Vir- Virgoan space probe. Yes. Which has been infected by the crinoids. It's in three forms as well, because you have the ship, you have the pilots, and uh, it's... Uh... Yeah, it's almost kind of got like a Holy Trinity thing going on. <laughs> it reminded me a little bit of the um, probe from Fear Her. Oh, okay, right. The little probe in that, just the kind yeah. of the, the suburban setting and, and that yeah. kind of called back. The pigeon reminds me a lot of Frobisher, the Six Doctor's companion from the comics. Mm-hmm. A lot. So, yeah, basically, if you enjoy Frobisher, then you quite enjoy this sort of wisecracking pigeon. The doctor sat cross-legged in the attic of Joe's flat, tinkering with a small, intricate piece of equipment on the floor in front of him, and occasionally shooting a venomous glance at the pigeon. Vergoans, a race of shape-shifting, biomechanical symbiotes with an obsession for temporal tidiness. The Vergoans were excellent at discovering temporal anomalies and always tried to fix them. Badly, but with unbounded enthusiasm. The doctor sighed the temporal equivalent of cowboy builders. The pigeon had followed him back to the flat, where he had made himself a cup of tea and demanded an explanation. We're a survey team. We detected an anomaly here on Earth and came to investigate. We? We. I. Don't forget, I'm a Virgoan. Ship, pilot, probe. There are three of me. Or us. It can get confusing at times. I know the problem said the doctor. There are thirteen of me. You're the probe, I take it. Yes. And you decided that assuming the form of a talking pigeon would be nicely inconspicuous. I was one of those little wasp things to begin with, but people kept trying to swipe me with newspapers. This is much better. 
they had eventually found dozens of small-scale anomalies here, the pigeon explained. Not much on the temporal scheme of things, just a few individuals displaced by 80 years or so. Joe had been the first of the anomalies to be fixed. Is this Gabbins? The pigeon nodded at the instrument at the doctor's feet. Time anchor. Holds the subject in a state of temporal stability. Fixes him in one time period. The tachyon field... I know how a time anchor works, thank you. The doctor's voice was icy. But I can't seem to activate this one. Course not. I'm jamming it. Well, kindly unjam it. No. The doctor closed his eyes and took a deep breath. The doctor unravels the plan and fixes everything, but not after a whole lot of stuff happens. And we've got like cheetah fighting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The mask becomes full on cheetah, and, and and also there's this giant cop out of an ending as well. So because the 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 kind of the the probe, the Vagoan probe has kind of turned green and everyone's like, oh, it's been taken over by the crinoid. But no, it's just shape-changing to kind of make people think it's been taken over by the crinoid. You, you go, what? It makes no sense. Yeah, it's kind of a deus ex machina ending. Yeah, yeah. With the crinoid, or the the non-crinoid infected probe coming in to save everything. Yes. This one was okay, I thought. There were some cool ideas in it, but it just it seemed like there was a lot going on for a short story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it felt like maybe like a modern TV story, um, but, uh, and I, I can hear the TARDIS in the background. One thing I would say as well, because uh, uh, it looked on TARDIS Wiki and its category of stories set in Croydon, which also features a 10th Doctor comic featuring a crinoid in a Croydon garden centre. I don't know what it is about kind of crinoids and Croydon. <laughs> <laughs> Croydon doesn't have a great rep, but it's it's, it's, it's not uh, sort of uh, nationally, but it, it's, it shouldn't be beset upon by sort of giant vegetation. Maybe it's the alliteration in the name. Yeah. I guess Croydon and crinoid. Yes. So our next story mm. is... Uh... Freedom by Steve Lyons. Yes, of Conundrum and various other things. Yeah, I've read three or four of his books, mm -hmm. and I've generally really enjoyed his work. Um, so this is a story involving the Third Doctor, the Brigadier, uh, and Joe Grant. Yes, and also the Master. Yay! For a change. So we got two uh, were tigers back to back with the cheetah people, <laughs> and, and now we get two Master stories back to back. Yeah, yeah, because um, there is supposed to be a theme of freedom throughout this book. I mean, this story is called Freedom. I mean, yeah, I'm not too sure how frequently freedom actually appears as a theme. Um, so Doctor and Joe head off to a kind of prison break because the Master has managed to hypnotize local people to break him out of Stangmore Prison. This is a story as well that it, it's done in kind of two threads. You've got Doctor and Joe stuck in some kind of prison that they cannot get out of and it's just them in in, in this kind of basically little bottle universe type of and, and you've also got the events leading up to it yeah um, and the doctor is also starting to see kind of images of uh, of his alternative selves um sort of the second um uh, doctor and the fifth doctor kind of warning him about something because he's discovered that all of the people that were trying to break into the prison work for the same company a freedom corporation which is a company the master had established himself 30 years earlier and has brainwashed or hypnotized a bunch of people that have worked for that corporation over the years to the point where that when he's finally um kind of locked up in stangmore prison everyone he has hypnotized goes there to try and free him creating a huge uh chaotic scene yeah as the doctor hurtled down country roads at a frightening velocity left bridge stewart to brief joe i had a feeling this might happen there was a hint of smugness in his voice that's why i left troops on standby at the prison you still want to give the master the keys to his own guest room, Doctor? Their driver concentrated on the road ahead and said nothing. The prison gates were hanging open. Bessie screeched to a halt in the courtyard beyond and Joe stared. The area was swarming with civilians. Unit soldiers were attempting to contain them, but they were overwhelmed. They're under some sort of mind control, cried Sergeant Benton. We can't use our weapons without hurting them. I don't think we can keep them out of the main building for much longer. Blast, said the brigadier. 
and it takes only one person to reach the master cell with a key, said the doctor tartly. The cunning old rogue. He must have planted suggestions in a hundred minds before he was caught. He thought hard. We need to remove their objective. The doctor vaulted out of the car and forced his way into the confused throng. Joe followed him. She knew he was hoping to reach the master before anyone else did. Then she spotted something. Look! The doctor followed her line of sight and nodded grimly. One figure alone was fighting against the crowd, trying to reach the gates. Immediately, the doctor set off in pursuit. Private! Corporal! Anybody! Restrain that man! Two soldiers had heard the doctor's shouts. They cut the man off and held on to him, despite his struggles, until the doctor arrived. Nice try, old chap. But I'll take this now, if you don't mind. In one smart motion, he yanked off the man's face and revealed an all-too-familiar bearded countenance beneath. Because he's going kind of against the, the flow. Everyone's trying yeah. to get to the prison, and he's the only one going the other way. So they stop him. <laughs> and a blonde wig as well. But um, it's a trap because he gets stuck in this, in this construct. Mm. And it isn't until the Time Lords intervene and temporarily restore the Doctor's... Uh, knowledge of time travel mm. and the dematerialization circuit he's able to escape the prison mm. yeah so this is where we get controversial though mm. uh because the doctor realizes that he has a choice mm. uh so that he can rescue earth from the masters um this kind of weird timey wimey stuff or he can just kind of just go off into the time vortex with his tires and and leave Earth to its fate in the assumption that the Time Lords would probably do something. Yeah. And he seems and he seems to seriously, seriously consider doing it. Yeah, I'm not sure that I can see the third Doctor doing this. Yeah, he he's convinced by Joe to to stay in Earth's run yeah. of his obligations on Earth. But yeah, I think of all the Doctors, the third Doctor wouldn't need convincing to to go back. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you could imagine possibly the fourth, <laughs> maybe on some of his more alien moments. But I was just really interested to think, this isn't a third Doctor I recognise. Uh, and, and also, it ends quite strangely as well, because you the Doctor sort of knocks, well, the Doctor persuades the Master to give him this, this you know, just power cell type thing, knocks him out, and then kind of we see the Doctor rushing off to kind of go and save the world, but we don't find out exactly how he does it. And uh, we see the Doctor musing about the fact that um, he's not, you know, he, like the Master, is still a prisoner and doesn't have his freedom. But I just, it was not in line with my interpretation of the Doctor. It was well written, but I was, yeah. And yeah. Steve, Steve Lyons knows his stuff. But. Yeah, it wasn't one of my favorites, but it was, uh, I, I liked some of the, he captured the, the era quite well, you know, apart from the mm -hmm. one decision of the of the third Doctor. But mm. um, yeah, yeah, because yeah, I've seen people online say about uh, how he captures the third Doctor perfectly, and I think mm. ish until the final two pages. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I I heard a TARDIS calling. Yes, and right. it's taking us to uh... Cambridge. Yes. <laughs> Cambridge uh, shortly after uh, the events of Shada. <laughs> yes. Um, featuring yeah. the fourth Doctor and Romana. And this is Glass by Tara Sams, a.k.a. Uh, Stephen Cole. Yeah. And this is an interesting short story. It's told it from, it's a first person. I think it's the mm -hmm. only story we get that's in first person. And it's told from uh, the perspective of an unnamed woman who is seeing reflections of a ghastly face in different surfaces and she sees yeah. this appearing in mirrors and windows um yes everywhere wh in the news agents wh smiths uh, i've seen many hideous <laughs> things in wh smiths including new adventures covers yeah so she, she sees this kind of like child's face but with adult eyes and an evil smile basically it turns into into a recluse she's sort of in her bedroom with the kind of curtains drawn and uh, and sort of like no one's believing her and she's going mad and she's being haunted by this face mm. uh, and then the Doctor and Romana arrive and the Doctor starts shoving jelly babies through the letterbox This must have gone on for a week Then the two people came 
One was a doctor, or so he said when he called through the letterbox. Then he said something like, It's about that face you've been seeing. And I suddenly felt light-headed with relief. Someone else had seen it. I wasn't crazy. I actually went out into the hall to let him in. Then I stopped. What if it was the face? What if the body had come looking for the face? I stood there for ages. Then the man called my name again, and his voice was deep and warm-sounding, and I knew he was okay. There was a girl's voice, too. You can trust us. In fact, you must trust us. We need your help. She sounded quite kind, but a bit hoity-toity as well, you know. Well, I couldn't decide what to do. When something plopped through the letterbox, I almost screamed. Then I saw it was a jelly baby, and I started laughing. I couldn't stop. I opened the door, and there he was. Tall man, brown curly hair with a huge grin on his face. Blonde girl next to him, grinning. Then they were both inside, going towards the lounge. Don't go in there, I shouted. And the tall man, the doctor, looked at me with big pale blue eyes. He'll be there! The doctor didn't stop looking at me, and I could tell things were serious. I know about the face, he said. You must tell me when you first saw it, and how often you've seen it since. The doctor is let into the house, and, uh, and they discover that the, um, the, the greenhouse, every pane of glass has this face in it that there's a kind of a big old fight that we don't really quite understand because we're seeing it from her point of view so what the creature is um though it is we we know that it's something that's escaped from shada i think we find we find out that it's one of the scientists that um was was absorbed by the yeah. by the sphere who was trying to get back out of whatever mm. dimension he was in but yeah. um, and it ends up kind of sucking the doctor through one of the panes of glass, and I pictured kind of the the doctor stepping through the window of the TV movie sort of <laughs> thing, but with the fourth doctor, and uh, yeah. he ends up fixing it so that creature is not going to try and break through ever again. But the woman is yeah. all sh- shook up, you know, ab- mm. about the incident and never yeah. never forgets it. And yeah, um, this one I thought was kind of forgettable. I did like some of the the dialogue between. Uh, the fourth doctor and the second Romana was really well done mm-hmm. and kind of captured the era of like the late uh, Douglas Adams. Mm. Yeah. Cause they do feel quite alien. I mean, they are very much, she, she's the, the woman's not able to get a char- get a hold on their character. Um, yeah. She, she finds them quite off putting and strange when I was reading it. I, cause I, I knew this was written in the nineties. I knew this was written before the, the modern show. But Elizabeth to me was kind of thinking it would be quite natural if this was um, the Tenth Doctor and Rose that were about to appear rather than the Doctor and Romana. It feels like a story inspired by the modern era. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah, I I must say I greatly enjoyed this. This is one of the highlights of the collection for me. But uh, I, I think it was just because it just felt so fresh sort of seeing it from the woman's perspective uh, and you know you, and you do really see the mental difficulties going through with losing her job I mean I think does she lose her marriage well certainly it's implied that her marriage is on very rocky ground at the end of it mm-hmm. um, and you're seeing the kind of like the consequences of being a peripheral figure in a Doctor Who story I, I thought it was really interesting I, I like stories in which you sometimes kind of see the Doctor as other people see him like kind of like in snake dance. I mean, that's one of the examples that's often cited with that kind of thing. Yeah, I enjoyed this, but I can see why others might not. Just, I didn't not enjoy it. I just, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't super, the, the plot, I guess, wasn't super memorable to me. Just in that, mm. you know, apart from the faces and the reflections, which um, comes up in a lot of different types of stories. Yeah. Yeah. Right, should we, should we move on to, to Mondas Passing? Yes. This first of two stories written by Paul Grease, who doesn't seem to have done anything much else um, uh, that I'm aware of. This is a Doxalus story featuring Polly Wright and Ben Jackson meeting up in a hotel room on December the 31st, 1986. Uh, so there's uh, this there to reminisce um is they've been back on earth now for kind of over 20 years 
and they're married to other people. And they're kind of just sort of reminiscing about what it was like fighting the Cybermen, or at least that seems to be what they're going to do, but they don't really spend much time talking about it, and it's yeah, it's just quite sad, really. Yeah, I rather enjoyed this one. This was... Uh, oh, okay. I, I liked the... It reminded me a little bit of um, the part in uh, The Hungry Earth and Cold Blood, that mm-hmm. two-parter, where uh, Amy and Rory go back, you know, much older and to, to watch themselves mm-hmm. uh, with, with the Doctor, kind mm-hmm. of off in the distance. And because you get the events of the Tenth Planet and the upcoming Christmas special um, <laughs> playing out, and they're yeah. they're realizing that hey, we're down in Antarctica right now fighting Cybermen. It was kind of a cool moment, and yeah, it, it ends kind of sadly with Ben saying, you know, hey, I'll maybe we'll see each other in 2070. Uh, mm. When you know, of course they'll be long gone by then, but that's when the events of uh, the moon base happens, which is their next kind of event that they experience in history uh, mm. from from their perspective in in terms of living. Well, for the TV, yeah, yeah, yes, they've forgotten about invasion of the cat people. Oh. Um. <laughs> yeah. Although uh, a couple of uh, the roundheads gets a reference, and uh, Salations from uh, the Murder Game mm. uh, get yeah. re- get reference too, but um, yeah, just. Uh, Kind of an interesting, sad story, and it's kind of out of continuity too, because I think it's implied in the Five Companions, which is a audio with Polly that her and Ben did end up getting t- together after all. Yeah, yeah, which is what I, what I want to happen. I just I didn't like the trend in yeah, in kind of Doctor Who fiction in the nineties that bad things happened to the companions after they left, and it was all really great. I just, can we just have a bit of hope? Ben just feels just. Like the world is totally against him. He's in a loveless marriage. He's really in love with Polly. Polly's in love with some some rich chap, and uh, it's just yeah, kind of sad. Yeah, yeah, I, mm. yeah. Oh well. <laughs> Speaking of uh, companions oh. with unfortunate endings, our next story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, the poster child for it. I'm looking forward to reading Man in the Velvet Mask. That will, that will be a laugh riot, won't it? Uh, yeah, it's the first Doctor and Dodo. Um, in the, and there are fairies at the bottom of the garden, which is written by Sam Lester, who uh, apparently never wrote anything ever again. Which Whom, would, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking is... Uh... <laughs> is another pseudonym yes because if i wrote this i'd want to change my name as well it's not good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can get a master out of the out yeah. of those letters i think too yeah well, it's the master isn't it hmm. yeah so yeah. this is the doctor and dodo land on a planet that is kind of in an, an advanced state of decay and yes. you have dodo kind of ready to throw up and is <laughs> uh i think is going to be sick and uh, it just is a really bad planet all around. And yeah. the doctor's trying to get her interested in her surroundings. And she's just lamenting that she's traveling with him. And why is she even a companion? Which fans sometimes wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've wondered that about Dodo. Dodo has some good stories. I mean, this is the thing. So Dodo is good in, um, oh gosh, the Western one, the name that which escapes me. Oh, the Gunfighters. The Gunfighters, yeah, I enjoy her in that. Um, and she's also not terrible um, in the arc, mm, yeah, I would say. But uh, yeah, uh, I just feel that she's, yeah, you know, she was hard done by on the show at the time. And yeah, this, this is not a really particularly great portrayal of her, but then again, her characterization is so inconsistent. Yeah. And the kind of the twist of this story mm. is that Dodo and the Doctor stumble upon a garden that's very. It's like a crystalline structure. It's very beautiful in contrasting with the rest of the surroundings. Dodo sees little tiny fairies made out of crystal flying around everywhere, and she's just delighted by it all. And then mm. the kind of the big lumbering blob-like creature that had been they had been following um, mm. kind of lets out a roar and splits open, and you have Dodo kind of exclaim in delight, you know, oh, because there's a little fairy inside, so she's thinking, oh, this must be like their cocoon form, and mm. they're bursting forth, but it turns out it's more like what happens with like Alien and the Xenomorphs, <laughs> <laughs> in that the, uh, the crystal fairies are an infection on this planet, so it was, I think it might have been the Doctor's way of trying to teach her that you know, beauty is um, uh, in the eye of the beholder, so to speak, mm-hmm. and that uh, just because something looks beautiful doesn't mean that it is and that it's, that it can be deadly. I don't know that I took yeah. much more away from it than that. 
Mm. Um, you, you made it sound better than um, than, <laughs> than what I was reading. It, but, uh, oh, this was a slog to me. I don't know. When you've got two characters, well, obviously the Doctor is, is distant in this, and you've got Dodo just being miserable and having sort of nasty things happening to her. And just, oh, yeah. Did Dodo and the Doctor ever travel alone together? I because I maybe in the books, yes. Because oh. you you have the man in the velvet mask. Oh, between uh, savages and okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, so so th- this is set during that delightful period, because um, Stephen is not there, and I think Stephen, they, it's implied that Stephen's gone fairly recently. Hmm. Uh, but, yeah. Ah dear, poor Dodo. Can't catch a break. No, 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 no. You can see why Jackie Lane doesn't do any conventions. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Should we move on to Mother's Little Helper? Yes, Mother's Little Helper, written by Matthew Jones. Yes, who um, wrote um, uh, the Impossible Planet. Oh yes. Okay. Same same guy. Same guy. Uh, he also wrote um, a Doctor Who new adventure, Bad Therapy, and uh, and also a Benny new adventure. And he is, for my mind, one of the great undersung authors of the new adventures of that period. Um, everything of his I've read, I've loved. Hmm. Um, spoilers, including this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, your, your opinions may vary so we've got we're focusing on Nancy who is an American girl living in England in the annoyingly named Southmouth uh, or Southmouth uh, I'm not too sure how you pronounce it because it probably is Southmouth is probably how it would be pronounced because we tend to mumble our mouths in place names she's kind of new to town um her uh, her best friends um slept with her boyfriend it's, it's, it's all rather teen drama uh and uh, she bumps into this young lad uh who's kind of dressed in unusual clothing he's kind of got golden eyes and she has kind of like emotional well her emotional pain and physical pain starts fading away when he touches her mm-hmm. and uh, and then the boy's being chased by this tall blonde woman then she encounters the second doctor so and i've seen stuff saying that this is definitely the season 6b second doctor mm. i don't know whether that is the case or not there's a reference to his hair going gray so maybe maybe that's why they and that he doesn't have companions so yes yeah he doesn't have companions but it could also because this does feel like we are we are in the middle of an adventure mm. um and uh, kind of Nancy stumbling upon. So if, at this point, Nancy and the do- the doctor go r- look for the boy, and he's mm. kind of seen near a derelict pier, which is mm. uh, kind of falling down. And Nancy goes home, and she changes her mind. She comes back, uh, looks for the doctor, and the doctor she finds him in the pier in one of the buildings, and they're having an argument. And the boy's mm. nearby, and he has like this metallic band around his neck, which is like mm-hmm. a control collar the woman has is the one who's controlling this collar Mm. uh inflicting pain and they they get away but um nancy gets knocked unconscious uh by the woman who sees her and she wakes Mm. up and she has a control collar on and the woman's like hiding out like in her underwater submarine (laughs) and uh they they decide to do a trade where the doctor will swap the boy for nancy but then uh kind of turns on him and starts killing nancy you know after this the swap happens and she's yeah. trying to get the collar off and she can't the boy runs to her and uh takes away all of her pain and then this part's kind of unclear to me in the in the narrative but mm. channels that energy into the woman causing her to uh basically poof away into a cloud of ashes yeah the doctor and the boy uh go off and nancy goes home and she sees him a few days later at the far end of the beach kind of just yeah and and the doctor suddenly kind of turns and waves and just wanders off mm-hmm. it's kind of like a fairy tale rendition in some ways of, of 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 the doctor so kind of very matt smithy in some in some aspects and i expected the woman was going to be the rani oh uh 
I didn't I'm have it. To... Yeah, I didn't pick up. Kind of have that in my mind, but mm. I could see that totally in mm. terms of how she was described and portrayed. Yeah, but I, I enjoyed how nebulous this was. That we don't really know what is going on, what the Doctor is up to with this boy, but it, it does just feel like kind of glimpses of an adventure. Kind of like the Doctor and Martha in Blink when they're hunting the mm. the thing that's hatching, where yeah. we just see glimpses of a different adventure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed this one. This was probably one of my favorites, I think, of the collection. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was. Yeah, it, it, it was lovely. I mean, Matthew Jones is such a good writer as well, because uh, like you, he, he kind of touches upon the emotional aspects of it, um, and does really, really good job. Uh, he also wrote um, for uh, Doctor Who magazine, wrote a series of columns that was kind of almost not quite a confessional, but it he was always kind of putting in his own personal take on various stories and just and various aspects of just being a Doctor Who fan. And those were gorgeous reads. Um, Matthew Jones, if what we've spoken about just now seems interesting, just go and sort of seek out any of his work. And dude wrote probably one of the best 10th Doctor story. Totally so, agree. Yeah. 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 All right. So next up, we have a Fifth Doctor and Nissa story mm. called uh, The Parliament of Rats by Daniel O'Mahony yes. of Falls the Shadow fame. <laughs> yes, and also the man in the velvet mask. Yeah, a man who has a history of doing weird things to companions <laughs> in his stories. Um, we kind of start off uh, sort of in the middle of things with TARDIS in the middle of the sea on this ocean planet uh, um, the doctor is kind of like near drowning and uh, and they're rescued uh, the uh, this planet that there's kind of various different sort of time zones appearing um sort of like time periods and there's it's yeah it's all, it's all rather timey-wimey and the ship which is called the land of heaven has a navigator who is a time sensitive type of person called Constantine and uh, they are hunting out the Parliament of Rats uh, which is uh, this kind of legendary ship that sometimes appears in the time periods uh, yeah yeah it's, it's an odd one <laughs> this one has uh, two different ships one is the one that rescues the Doctor and Nyssa and then the other one is a like a pirate ship or think of like a like a ghost ship from maybe mm. Pirates of the Caribbean or something that's been lost in this time storm or you know for for 100 years kind of wandering around and the doctor's getting headaches from all the different time fractures and think it's set nissa makes reference to the fact that he's recently regenerated but this is also the only one in the story so i would think it would (laughs) happen during the gap between arc of and yeah tegan's uh, working for the show with him um yeah i i i either that or uh, or or adric and tegan have kind of had a cold or something sort of the reverse of what Nissa experiences during kinder the story kind of goes through a couple different twists and turns but mm. it's eventually revealed that the navigator of the what is not the pirate ship so the other ship mm. is a time sensitive so mm. she's not quite a time lord but she's able to kind of navigate the different time zones and the doctor eyes her warily, and it turns out that she she's a piece of time lord technology that I I had to look this up, but it turns out <laughs> it's, it's the it's the metal from Silver Nemesis. Oh god! It's yeah, it's shaped both into a staff which yeah. the doctor holds and is you know tells it to dissolve itself, and it does. But then yeah, it's just kind of a odd story. I'm okay reading something that I don't quite understand if if I'm enjoying the writing and everything. It just wasn't holding my attention. I mean, it's not the worst Fifth Doctor um, short story I've read. There's there's one in the first Decalogue that's uh, I recall being an utter stinker. Yeah, this is just yeah, this is not no, not it's... really clear what was going on, and it, there was some sort of uh, it was called a white hole, which was like a black hole, but it created things. It was just as a power source. It was, it was just kind of a, a lot going on, and just not entirely clear. So yeah, I mean. I'll... I suspect it was probably very clear in Daniel Mahoney's mind, which, which is nice because, like, sometimes when you're reading these stories, you go, like, "Yeah, the author's got no idea what's happening here either." Um, <laughs> but it, I didn't get that vibe from this. But I just, yeah, yeah. Oh well, oh. <laughs> let's not pick any of his books anytime soon. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I hope you don't pick "Man in the Velvet Mask." <laughs> yes, that this is this combi- combined with Dodo would be a. Uh... 
Oh. No, 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 no. I wouldn't okay. mind doing that for a, kind of like a July episode because uh, for Bastille Day, um, um, uh, 14th of July, which is a kind of French version of kind of the 4th of July, we are not doing that next so. <laughs> time. Right. <laughs> We've got another story by uh, by Paul Greece um, uh, writes, uh, this doesn't involve um, former companions in the marital crisis. So yay! Uh, but it does feature the fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane. They're on the planet's rash. Posing as Earth delegates because there's a ratification happening with this planet. And they're, is it that they're wanting to join the Federation? I couldn't uh, remember. Yeah, but... it, there's a slight Peladon vibe, isn't there? Uh, and those early scenes, but it's just basically an excuse for because we didn't have psychic paper in those days for them to not be arrested. And the, these aliens are very different than humans. You get a lot of references to people being bipedal versus having multiple uh, limbs and arms, and and how confining it must be to have uh, only two legs instead of. Mm. So I don't know if they were like centipede people or. Yeah, well, the... because it's never clearly stated, and it and it also t- it's a few pages in that they're sort of oh by the way yeah they've all got tons of legs, and it's like oh oh okay that would be nice too because I'm just imagining like, you know standard BBC actors possibly with a little bit different hair. And I feel like there was like a an abortion allegory happening with the yeah. um, babies being killed for their uh, brain fluid so kind of like a like a stem cell sort of thing going on i thought it was possibly i, I could see why you'd say that um i was thinking more animal rights mm. certainly that's been that, that that was a major theme in 90s politics uh mm. and and was often pick up often pop up in, in doctor who stuff around about that time so that was how i could read that but i can i can definitely see how you how you kind of read abortion into it yeah, as an American, it's probably a, more of a... <laughs> yeah, it's more yeah. the go-to, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, th- there's kind of various kind of like political factions at play um, on, on the planet as they're all trying to kind of find ways to sort of save the population from kind of becoming sterile. And, and there's kind of riots and whatnot. Yep, and there's like a 20-foot-tall killer robot <laughs> that shows up <laughs> yeah. by, from yeah. one of the factions and... Yeah there's a basically a big fight at the end and the leader gets killed and then the doctor kind of suggests hey you should work together to solve your problems and away he goes (laughs) yes yeah yeah it's not at all clear how will they go to stop the killer radiation yeah (laughs) it's just like yeah don't do any more giant robots (laughs) bye bye lots of love Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've enjoyed retelling this more than reading it. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was, was... Yeah, for me, it was kind of confusing. There wasn't um, a whole lot going on. No, yeah. no, um, no. It wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't Shall we? Uh... Shall we just draw a veil over that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next up. Wish you were here. Yes, the Sixth Doctor. Mm, yeah, by uh, Guy Clapperton, which is a name I recognise, but I don't know why. Oh, he, he did another Decalogue book, and uh, oh, and so he's also done writing. He did some writing for the Radio Times to do the um, the modern series. He is still around. So we've got the Sixth Doctor um, traveling around on his own, and uh, he visits um, um, this tourist planet called Nestra. Uh, and he's uh, searching down an old friend of his, um, uh, Cricklin, uh, and yeah, because I had a six doctor in particular seemed to have a whole host of old friends he's never mentioned before or since. <laughs> and usually, when he decides to check out his mates, they end up dead. Um, so it's, it's a bit like Jessica Fletcher. He's like, no, please don't be your friend. <laughs> so yeah, and so there are tourists kind of going missing, and he encounters this woman who's pretending to be a tourist. Um, but she's really um, an agent of the people running the planet, uh, and, uh, and her name is Janice Karma. Starting at the bottom, the shoes were normal enough, she supposed, although the red spats were rather unusual. Yellow trousers with black stripes she could take too, but with that waistcoat? Of course, there was nothing intrinsically wrong with a checked red waistcoat, 
but not with that pale blue cravat with the white spots. As for the coat, well, one lapel was pink, the other yellow, the collar checked, and the rest predominantly red, with cuffs to match the trousers. The whole ensemble was truly shocking. The stranger responsible for thrusting this appalling vision upon her was smiling at a rose, of all things. He looked at the rose encouragingly, sniffed it a little, and nodded at it. Janice could stand the performance no longer. "'What are you doing?' she asked. "'Communicating with a rose,' he said, as if this should be obvious. Janice had started backing towards the door almost before she was aware she wanted to be anywhere but here. This was getting to be a bore. He was definitely following her. His strides were long enough to keep up with her without any apparent effort, and from the look on his face, he seemed to be finding the exercise positively stimulating. "'Ah, the rose!' he declared conversationally. "'Quite remarkable. Of course, human appreciation of it is so limited to an insect. It appears entirely different, a riot of colour and excitement. I myself can identify 170 different levels of the spectrum. Insects are attracted to the rose because of its dazzling appearance, and so pollination takes place. Mankind cultivates the rose for aesthetic purposes, creates new strains. The rose survives and thrives simply through its ability to give pleasure to others.' He smiled a broad, thin smile. It's a bit like you Thetrans here on Nestra. Look, mister, doctor, look, doctor, I'm sure you're a very nice person and all that. Thank you. But if you don't mind, this is where I leave you. I'm here for a quiet holiday, nothing else, so if you'll excuse me. The strange man looked only marginally disappointed. Of course, he said gesticulating around the narrow marble stairway they had now reached. Make the place your own. Have a nice day. Do what tourists usually do. Her relief was almost palpable. She turned and started to make her way out. It's just that I'd have sworn you were here as a Thetran agent, armed to the teeth, and trying not to look as though you had a tracer implanted under the index finger of your right hand. Janice stopped dead. She would have sworn that the blood literally stopped flowing around her body for a moment. Just a hunch. She turned to face the doctor very, very slowly, only to be greeted by the ample acreage of his disappearing back. I'll be in the coffee lounge if anyone wants me, he added, turning round with what was no doubt intended as a winning smile. They uh, also encountered a, a robot um, called Laxis, possibly. Um, I wasn't sure how you pronounce that. Laxis, I think. Yeah, Laxis. Um, and Laxis has been programmed to give the tourists whatever they like and refuse them whatever they don't like. Nothing could go wrong there. No, no. <laughs> what, yeah, what, what could possibly go wrong? Janice um, gets captured by Laxis. And then, kind of, you know, the, the doctor kind of he wanders off, bumps into another old friend, uh, and discovers that this this second friend, a person called Katar, who may be a Klingon, <laughs> is uh, is actually an artificial life form that uh, Laxus is using to trap the doctor. I was like, what? 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 <laughs> and Laxus doesn't realise the consequences of his actions because uh, he's been. His artificial intelligence has been programmed without like a compassion chip or something. And Laxus basically he's looking after a whole host of ill people. Um, they're sick from overindulgence, and Laxus has refused to give him medication because that's something they don't like. And that's going against his programming. Aww. Hmm. Basically, um, the doctor and Janice manage to escape, and Janice blows up Laxus. Uh, uh, even though Laxus has now realised what he was doing wrong. And uh, and just as the Doctor is kind of getting ready to leave Nestra, not really having done anything about his mate Coraclem, who was kind of like a big important part of the story earlier. Um, unless Coraclem dies or just, just gets forgotten about for, for narrative purposes. We encountered Janice again and her new robot, Laxus II, um, who's um, been kind of put together from components from the first. 
and so the doctor doctor leaves and lax a second decides to start doing some kind of some dental work on janice <laughs> and uh, and then in the kind of like the closing goes ah yes you're the one that killed my brother and uh, the implication is he probably goes on to kill Janice. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is uh, an odd one. Um, yeah. it, it felt like a kind of, it felt more like a comic strip. In some mm. respect. Yeah, I was kind of disappointed that this was the only entry for the Sixth Doctor in mm. the collection. Because you would think that with 16 stories that it would work out to be two each. But the Fifth and Sixth Doctor only get one story each. And then the Fourth Doctor gets three stories. So, yeah. Yes. And, and Ben and Polly's marital issues gets one all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it's a bit of a missed opportunity. I mean, I quite like the twist that... Um, that yeah, Janice gets killed by the robot, but uh, yeah. Yeah, kind of a hoisted on your own petard sort of uh, ending, yeah. Yeah, but it, it just felt it just needed another bit of editing, maybe. Yeah. Um, Shall we uh, go on to the next one? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Ace of Hearts. Yes, with uh, the Seventh Doctor and Ace, sort of, or Dorothy. Yes, and Mike Tucker and Robert Perry again. Yes. Um, yeah. This was a kind of a fun little short story. So the doctor takes a job as an entertainer playing the spoons and maybe involving something with ferrets. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> At a annual reunion dinner hosted by Dorothy uh, McShane's family. And after the reunion, he stays over at their house for the night and he sneaks into Dorothy's room. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> and, yeah. And yeah. he... Uh, basically has a conversation with ace um talking about how all the bad stuff he's gonna do in the future to her <laughs> yeah oh, dear. yeah yeah and uh he says he's gonna have to manipulate her yet again so i don't know what that's in reference to but i'm sure it's any number of times that the doctor puts ace into certain situations yeah. um before he leaves he takes a baby photograph of ace and replaces it with a uh, playing card the mm-hmm. uh, Ace of Hearts, uh, the, for which the story is named. So when the grandmother comes in... Yes, from Curse of Fenric. Yep. Yeah. I don't know how she would realize it was the doctor from the, the playing card. Was oh, that... No, it's also because she hears the TARDIS noise. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, and uh, she suddenly kind of goes, Oh yes, that madman playing the, the spoons in a Scottish accent. I know that, man! Funny she wouldn't place him uh, from meeting him and earlier in the evening but just from the TARDIS noise but well maybe you might just kind of go hi do I met you oh I don't know I'm busy doing a party yeah maybe I really like this one even though it was kind of on the shorter side it was um it didn't really have much of a point you know the doctor kind of it was creepy <laughs> I wish it would have gone somewhere or yes done but it was a, it was a nice short little scene I guess for what it was yeah, it was a short little scene it was just very stalkery yeah Again, I don't know whether you would necessarily have sort of say, yeah. I mean, I guess in like in the modern series, it, we've recently had the twelve tops are kind of popping in and it's, <laughs> hanging out with Bill's mum, mm. but it doesn't feel quite as weird as this. <laughs> um, I, I didn't especially kind of care for it. I'm not too sure I'm enjoying Mike Tucker and Robert Perry's writing style, so uh, so certainly. But who knows? Maybe I might pick kind of illegal alien at some point, uh, just for the benefits of my 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 tube traveller. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Shall we? Shall we move on? So next up, we have the People's Temple. Mm. which is uh, by Paul Leonard, yes. who um, I've read a Venusian lullaby by him. Mm. I don't know that I've read any other of his work. Maybe I have. Yeah, I've read Genocide um, from the Eighth Doctor novels. I think I might have read a Third Doctor and Joe story he did. Yeah. Like, took place in the desert or something. Or had, like, a scorpion. Yes, yeah, Dancing the Code. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've read that one, too. Yeah, because he's an interesting character, because he's... Um, I think he described himself as being not necessarily a fan, but but was, was quite keen on the work. Uh, but he would also let people... Um, he, he, he would kind of critique uh, other people's work uh, for money if you could have sent them to him and, stuff. and uh, so he could have hmm. and, and, and i've always found his stuff kind of quite well written if sometimes sort of a little bit unusual certainly genocide 
Yeah. But uh, yeah, so the People's Temple. Yeah. And it's uh, Stonehenge. With uh, the Eighth Doctor and Sam, who mm. we haven't really covered Sam before on this podcast, but no. she was uh, the first traveler with the Doctor in the novels, the Eighth Doctor. And she's, uh, yeah. I've, I've heard her described as kind of a Lisa Simpson character uh, with a Greenpeace t-shirt. I think that's being very flattering. Uh, I mean, I think she's just designed by committee. Um, there's, she, she's bland, I mm. found. Um, I mean, at least Lisa Simpson suggested there's a kind of get-go. Yeah, anyway, so... The plot of The People's Temple, think in an Earthly Child episodes two through four. <laughs> Because you you get uh, boys who are part of a tribe who are making a temple out of pebbles, and Mm. it cuts to um, several years later, they're grown up, and they have the idea to create um, Stonehenge, a life-size stone version of the temple that they wanted to build as uh, as kids. There's another tribe that they've conquered who they're using as slave labor to build build this, and... um, keep trying to make a particular schedule i'm not sure what's driving why they need to good project management good project management that's what's happening here <laughs> one of the girls uh who's working on the on stonehenge one of the slave girls she gets killed um mm-hmm. by a stone falling on her yeah it's quite a harrowing scene as well because because when we say girl we really mean girl as well because like, the impression that i got was like she's like eight or nine that kind of like really quite young yeah so th- things get quite nasty and awkward uh and uh yeah so just in time for doctor and sam to arrive because uh, like sam really wants to kind of see stonehenge in use and the doctor was sort of suggesting this might not be a terribly good idea uh and uh, and of course they split up uh, because it's a doctor who's sorry The doctor was propped up in his favourite armchair, feet on a stool, reading. A red mug of cocoa was on the arm of his chair, and Sam was cradling another one in her hands. In her lap was a book, a glossy, old-fashioned, rather heavy, hard-back book. I want to see Stonehenge. What century? Sam grinned. She liked the way that the doctor was never, ever taken aback, and usually managed to go one further. When it was built, it says in this book that no one will ever be sure how they move the stones. The doctor glanced up. Magic. Sam was surprised, but did her best not to show it. Did it work? she asked, as casually as she could manage. No, they had to use ropes in the end. The doctor grinned at his little joke, then went back to his book. Sam was disappointed, more disappointed than she'd expected. She hadn't really believed that there was any magic in an old stone circle, but there's no magic then? No, she glanced down at her book, meeting of ley lines, no natural temple of the people. The doctor glanced up sharply. I didn't say that. But magic isn't usually very useful. Any magic sufficiently advanced becomes indistinguishable from technology, and no fun any more. Shouldn't that be any technology sufficiently advanced? Yes, said the doctor. That's another way of putting it. The two kids one of, who are now grown-ups, um, mm-hmm. one decides to sacrifice the other because of the the incident that happened and kind of wants mm. to deflect the blame. Yeah, and you also get this other... You get another actual kid who um, sort of... Uh, Sam has taken in this lad called Oh, that's Dorber. right. Yeah. Yeah, who... Um, you know, Sam has this ingenious idea to use kind of like spray paint... Um, to try to kind of scare people um, by kind of spraying things into people's eyes. And so uh, Dolan's doing that, but he's disappointed when he discovers it doesn't actually kill people. So he goes, oh, I'll just stab them as well. Um, so that's nice. And there's a kind of like a big old fight that kind of goes on uh, and um, uh, between kind of Dolan's people and and the sort of the, the bear men who are the ones led by those two lads from earlier on yeah and basically they all kind of start fighting mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, sort and of... sam has to uh because she helps start kind of the uprising she has to help mm-hmm. take care and prepare the people who were killed yeah kind of work in the morgue so to speak mm. of the time and uh yeah they just kind of take off then and 
<laughs> yeah, just leave me to it. Doctor says, "Hey, do you wanna do you wanna go back to Stonehenge? He didn't really get. To, <laughs> we we arrived a little too early. He didn't get to see it, and she's <laughs> she's kind of like not quite in the mood for that anymore. <laughs> yeah." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I always found when I read about the Eighth Doctor and Sam, I have this kind of feeling of this odd feeling, almost like grief, because that's how I feel when I was when I was reading the novels featuring them. At that time, it just felt so raw that the TV movie didn't happen. And even though this is the first time that I've read uh, this particular short story, I kind of got that feeling again. You know, the the kind of like emotions of. Oh God! I wish this was on TV and that I wasn't having to read it. Mm. Uh, and yeah, it's strange that, um, that regardless of who's writing it, that seems to be how I, my emotional reaction to the crew. But uh, yeah, um, I, I enjoyed it. It was it was alright. Um, it's nice that Stonehenge wasn't being built by aliens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, there was no mention about any Pandoricas, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was well written. I thought it went on a little bit too long, and I thought it t- took a little bit too long for the Doctor and Sam to show up. But yeah. apart from that, it, it was okay. And that was the final story in the book. Mm. But the audio version included an audio exclusive yeah. short story uh, by David A. McEntee, who we uh, will remember from Face of the Enemy just a couple months ago. Yeah. This one's called Degrees of Truth, mm-hmm. and it features the third Doctor and the Brigadier, and is set... Not the Doctor of the Demons. Yeah, yeah after, after the Demons, and uh, it's... So one of the characters who died in that story, uh, Private Carver, he was the, if you remember, Bach, the uh, gargoyle, he, the uh, soldier that he kind of points at and uh the soldier disappears in a puff one of those soldiers was uh private carver and this audio story really is is just kind of an examination of what happens after a red shirt so to speak in unit dies Mm. and the brigadier has to write the death notification letter in this case it went to a major carver who's a retired was in the army Mm. at at one point and uh the major decides to pay the brigadier uh, a visit to find out what really happened with his son because of course yeah. this is all under a d notice and they can't um talk about it or anything yeah because the letter just is very very vague as to what happened and and major carver wonders why they don't even have a coffin to bury his son in and major carver rocks up and is kind of confronting the brigadier and it turns out He's got loads of grenades on him and uh, various other explosives because um, the, the brigadier decided, uh, oh, yeah, we'll bypass security for you. Um, I mean, at least they address it in the narrative. <laughs> the brigadier's like, oh, that was a bad idea. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should still just double check, make sure you don't have like a lunatic mm-hmm. uh, coming on. The doctor's there as well and mm. is kind of trying to between him and the brigadier you know figure out how can we talk this guy down from detonating this uh suicide bomb vest that he's wearing Mm -hmm. uh in the middle of unit headquarters so they figure out okay what's enough detail that we can reveal that will make sense without you know having to say that there were time lords and uh satanic demons involved and (laughs) cults and all this stuff The doctor allowed a weak smile to play on his lips and tried to give Carver a reassuring look. Major Carver, your son died on active duty in a classified operation. Lethbridge Stewart stared at Carver's face, seeking some sign of understanding. Circumstances did not permit recovery of a body, the brigadier said. Carver closed his eyes, and the brigadier could see that something seemed to give within the man. When he opened his eyes again, they were more tired than anything else. He sank into a seat and folded his coat around him as if suddenly cold. Do you have children, Brigadier? Lethbridge Stewart nodded, momentarily surprised by the question. A daughter, Kate. He realized almost immediately where Carver was heading with this information. Then, as a father, you must know that you have to answer me. The man smiled faintly. Drop your bombshell. Lethbridge Stewart carefully masked his feelings 
Had the situation been reversed, he would surely be just as desperate to find out the truth. But again the doubts hammered at him. What could he tell this man? An outright lie? Or the truth that, if made public knowledge from a respected military man such as Carver, could have disastrous consequences for national security? And was there a truth that Carver would actually accept without blowing them all sky-high? Do you know what unit actually does, Major? the doctor asked suddenly. The brigadier looked round at him, surprised. The Time Lord wore an expression the brigadier knew all too well. He had found a course to follow. So they, they come up with, you know, because the master was in the news as Victor Magister and that, you know, he had been captured and they're able to, to tell part of the story. Um a degree of truth, if you will, mm. to uh, alleviate the father's concerns and give him enough detail so that he stands down. And then yeah. uh, the doctor, you know, rushes to disarm the vest and turns out it was a, it was a fake. There weren't any real live grenades there anyway. So the brigadier doesn't turn the guy into the military police or anything. So he mm. kind of goes on his way with the knowledge that uh, his son died for a good cause. And the story concludes with a depiction of what Major Carver believes happened to Private Carver, to his son, uh, and sort of like him kind of confronting the magister and sort of being killed heroically in the line of duty, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought that, that was quite that was quite poignant, sort of seeing, you know, the, the <laughs> alternative facts, as it were, mm -hmm. of, uh, of what happened. I have to say I really liked this one. It was a good one to to end on i thought and it was it was just wonderful to hear nicholas courtney uh yeah read it you know to get one more performance as the brig from him was, was really mm. cool yeah it, it yeah it, it was it was brilliant i think this probably might even actually be my favorite story in the entire collection mm. uh i just really found it quite powerful and uh, yeah it's a shame that it's kind of it's 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 audio only because i mean this was more deserving of a place in the book than at least a couple of stories i can think of yeah. All right, so that's yeah. short trips. Mm. <laughs> so, so what did we think? Why don't, why don't you go ahead and? I, I was kind of, whilst I was reading it, I was talking back in my mind because like Decalogue will sometimes do some very experimental stuff. Like there's one Decalogue short story that is um, told in kind of iambic pentameter. And it's basically kind of like a Shakespearean sequel to Androids of Tara. And there's nothing quite as outlandish as that. Um, but uh, I, I think the high points for me kind of outshone the, um, you know, the, the less successful ones. Mm. It was quite nice just kind of having various different little flavors. And just some of them were, were very good, like sort of you know, Mother's Little Helper. Mm hmm and uh, yeah, Muzzle Helper and Glass uh, and Whole Flames and Degrees of Truth just really struck me well. I think my favorites were uh, Model Train Set, which may have been my favorite. Uh, I really liked Old Flames, uh, kind of the introduction of Iris mm. was really good. I rather enjoyed the kind of the melancholy of Mondas passing, even though it was it was kind of sad. Mm. Um, I, th I thought it was still a little sweet. And then uh, really like Degrees of Truth. I think my least favorite were probably Wish You Were Here, The People's Temple, mm. and um, probably the Fairies one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <sighs> overall, I yeah, if I had to rate the collection as a whole, hmm. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. I, hmm. I think I'm going to give this one a 5 out of 10. Yeah, I uh, th there were about half half the stories I liked and half the ones. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I might say a six. I do think that's been quite generous, but uh, but I'd say degrees of truth was 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 brilliant and and all flames. I finally saw what it is that people see in in Iris. Mm. So yeah, yeah, I was very glad I kind of read it. Just even if it's just for that. Because uh, I've always had that as kind of like a mental you know, blind spot. Uh, so, hmm. yeah. yeah. So, what did you think about doing an anthology for the podcast? I thought it was a. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Not something yeah. I'd want to do every month necessarily. No, <laughs> no. Um, but every once in no. a while, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it would be very interesting to sort of see what people kind of make of it and sort of whether they <laughs> whether they want us to forget about this as an experiment ever again yeah um as, as ever we kind of welcome your thoughts your feedback 
few suggestions. Speaking so. of, we have some listener feedback to share. Ah, okay. Is it anybody in a lime green shirt using wearing the, using the Jubilee line on Tuesday? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> So we got an email from Brian, uh, mm -hmm. and I apologize, Brian, because this ended up in our spam folder for some reason mm -hmm. and didn't catch it as quickly as it might have otherwise. But um, he wanted to drop us a line and let us know how much he's enjoying the new version of one of his favorite podcasts, which he says is quite cathartic because he's never fully recovered from rudely pushing the old host, Sean, out of the way for a copy of his favorite new adventure, Warhead, by Andrew Cartmel at a Gallifrey <laughs> One convention five years ago. <laughs> so, Sean, if you're listening, Brian wrote in. He's the one who pushed you out of the way so you could get to Warhead. Uh, right. by Andrew Cartmel before you could. And he said he uh, does not like to refer to it as Cat's Cradle Warhead because Andrew Cartmel <laughs> doesn't like that designation either. So Yeah, Cat's Cradle isn't necessarily a good <laughs> good collection of books to be associated yeah. with. <laughs> he goes on to say, uh, like both of us, he was a Wilderness Years Doctor Who fan, ran headlong into the books when his teenage imagination didn't find stories with the scope he saw in his first story, which was the TV movie. So uh, oh. we have that in common. Uh, him and I. And then he says uh, he now considers the new adventure Cream Suit 7th Doctor as his doctor, which Chris, I think you mentioned that mm, as well, that you yeah, kind of yeah. think of the doctor from the books as uh, in that vein. Yeah, um, yeah. He says it's great to hear a thoughtful look at these childhood gems with two enthusiastic hosts who have a similar Doctor Who history. Brian also talks about some of the Doctor Who connections he has, uh, which include helping restore the 8th Doctor TV movie console, oh! which is displayed at Gallifrey One these days. Yes, yes. And then yes. he also introduced his friend Athena uh, mm. to George Mann, and Athena became the character model for Cinder for the uh, Doctor Who Legacy video game. Okay. And uh, Brian built the Dalek prop gun and battery pack that uh, his friend Athena uses mm. when she cosplays as Cinder. So that's cool. Okay, that is very cool. That so is very cool. thank you, Brian. I think I've heard interviews with Brian. On, or certainly I've heard interviews with people that restored the console um, uh, on, on Radio Free Scar, I want to say. Uh, yeah, oh, cool. cool. Very cool. Yeah, he yes. sent in some... Uh, pictures from as well of kind of the detail of the prop gun and stuff which is mm -hmm. which is really cool to see we also have a couple of tweets to share mm -hmm. uh we have a tweet from our uh former host of the doctor who book club podcast eric stadnick who's now the uh, co-host of doctor who the writer's room he uh writes our final doom selection finally <laughs> it will be discussed in reference to uh, saint anthony's fire so we hope yes. we did that book justice <laughs> <laughs> as much justice as the book allowed us yeah. and yeah. uh we also got a tweet from graham burke uh host of reality bomb mm. and contributor to the recently released sydney newman memoir head of drama mm -hmm. by ecw press and graham says uh I've been wondering if we're going to finally get chameleonic fluctuation as part of the tv canon at christmas <laughs> so, uh, in reference to um, the TARDIS changing the shape of its uh, exterior shell and losing the uh, St. Am John's Ambulance logo in the uh, stacked roof. So, I think we might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a good chance. Yeah. Mark, Mark Gates is in the cast. You've got two TARDISes standing side by side that look quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it'd be great if we did. <laughs> I think uh, it might just be a passing allusion to it, but yeah. And uh, Graham also wrote that uh, he adores that Mark Gatiss came up with a brilliantly sober and rational explanation for the Seventh Doctor's first words, which... I went back to Time in the Ranny to suss out what those were, but I might be missing the connection, so perhaps one of our listeners can write in and explain it more fully, but the doctor kind of rattles off three different things, including like a, I think he said like a fluctuation in Sector 13, which um, I'm not sure what the tie-in there is to yeah. St. Anthony's Fire, but I'm sure there is one. So yeah, some great feedback from uh, mm -hmm. from our listeners. So thank you everyone for writing in, and as a reminder, mm -hmm. you can uh, reach us at 
andwbcpodcast at gmail.com if you want to send in an email. You can also uh, follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And please leave us a review on iTunes. Yes, yes, because it helps the algorithm. The algorithm is all important. It is. Yes. So next month, Chris, is your pick. Yes. What are we going to be reading? So, so um, we are going to be um, we're going to be reading a BBC book, um, which is the first novel featuring this particular TARDIS crew, uh, and it's a uh, also a, a book by by one of the kind of more well-known new adventures novelists who didn't appear in this short trips um, compilation we are going to be doing um eye of heaven by jim mortimer mm-hmm. so we um the fourth doctor and leela and uh, according to Tyler wiki uh, the enemy are peruvians so apologies if you are from the great country of peru <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, yes, all of Peru. All of Peru will be attacking the fourth Doctor <laughs> and Leela. Um, that's, that's great. I uh, I read, uh, I remember reading Blood Heat by Jim Mortimer and mm. remember rather enjoying it. I don't know that I've read anything else by him, but uh, looking forward to it. Even though I yeah. have to say the fourth Doctor and Leela is my least favorite pairing of ah! the fourth Doctor era. Okay. Um, if I had to rank them, I'd say... Both Romanas one and two are tied, and then right. maybe Sharon from the comics, yeah. and then Sarah Jane, and then K nine, and then Nissa Teagan and Adric, and then Leela. Really? Yeah, which is weird because okay. I'm a huge uh, Xena Warrior Princess fan, but yeah, I, c- I can't stand uh, that character <laughs> for some reason. So, <laughs> well, this might be a long month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I, yeah, I do be, really like the fourth Doctor, so maybe that'll balance out. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to see quite how they kind of just try and think of the best way to put it, but sort of, you know, to what extent they touch upon kind of Leela's character and how that is covered in a novel. Because I think it's the sort of thing that's possibly easier to, to depict on TV than, than it is is, is possibly in the book because uh, if you see too much from her viewpoint then it might just kind of get a bit oh kill kill oh <laughs> how can i eat this in a weird way uh but yeah yeah um i'm very fond of kind of leela um uh, myself so uh, is you know uh, she was in um in the possibly the third doctor who story i ever saw hmm. which was the invisible enemy <laughs> which Freaked the life out of me as a kid. I have not seen The Invisible Enemy. Yeah. It is, it is one of uh, eight Doctor Who classic stories that I have not yet seen. Oh, okay. Or it might be six, but it's uh, right. the stuff that came out at the end of the VHS range, so a um, few of those I haven't watched. But Yeah, it's probably not worth you necessarily going way out of your way to watch. <laughs> yeah. I, I did watch it kind of three or four years ago. But, oh, okay, this scared me. All right. Not very good. Yeah, so so we'll be doing that, and uh, and so it, it's kind of depict. Uh, I I understand that it's in kind of a few real life locations. Um, so, uh, including uh, Judgment on the Cover, Easter Island. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, it should be should be good. And so Jim Jim Mortimer, even bad Jim Mortimer, is interesting mm-hmm. uh, from my experience. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. It'll be our first fourth Doctor book that we've read. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, should be good. Cool. Well, until next month, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Happy reading. <laughs>Thank you for listening to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Special thanks to George C. Music for use of their song, Doctor Who theme, Swing Jazz Version. You can follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast and like us on Facebook. You can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. You can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to ANDWBCPodcast at gmail.com. And until next month, happy reading. It's night time now, and the, the summer, uh, the, the nights are drawing in. In June uh, and July, the sun sets after 10 o'clock.
uh, and uh, I, I don't know when the sun sets in the summer in kind of uh, in, in Minneapolis, but uh, so it's always slightly depressing when you're getting into August, September, and you're going like, oh yeah. Same here. Uh, usually it'll stay light out until about nine thirty p.m. or so. So yeah, not qu- not quite as far north as. So, uh, do you play? Well, I don't think anywhere is in America, is it? Apart from Alaska. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, but but it also tells me that there is such thing as a category of Doctor Who stories set in Croydon. <laughs> Wasn't it also where Sarah Jane was from? Yes, yes, it is, it is, it is. Um, so from a fictitious street in Croydon. Uh, I, um, now sometimes if I go past some nice streets, I go like, that was probably where Sarah Jane lived. <laughs> Right, anyway, that, that's enough of geography. Um, <laughs> right. 